morning. Again, here we are. Matthew chapter 8. This morning. We started in Matthew chapter 8 a couple weeks ago. Then we talked a little bit about Thanksgiving last week, so we will uh, continue in 8. See if we can't finish this chapter today, but I, I hope your Thanksgiving was wonderful. Mine was. I'm up about four or five pounds, which is good. It's not a bad thing. Winter's coming. We need a little extra. It's okay. It's hollow. <laughs> well, let's pray and let's get into God's Word. Lord God, we're gathered here together. Just to praise you, to worship you, to thank you, Lord, for all the good things you have done for us. Lord, we want to know you better and better and better. Because, Lord, you are so good. Your mercy, your grace, we're recipients of that. And we're thankful, Lord. Please speak to us. Please reveal to us your will for us as we look into your word. We bless our time together. We thank you, Lord, for each other. We thank you for this place where we can gather. I ask you to bless us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in going through chapter 8, a couple weeks ago, mentioned about how this really is a chapter on healing for the most part. There are a number of healings. The first one, in verses 1 through 4, was the very first one in the book where Jesus cleansed a leper. And I talked about how nobody is so dirty or so sinful or so bad that Jesus can't or won't touch them. The issue is not him. The issue is always us. Will we come to him and ask for these things? But he is always willing. And then the second healing was in verses 5 through 13. And it's where the centurion came. And he has a servant who's paralyzed back at home. Dreadfully tormented, the word says. And... Jesus says, I'll come and heal him, but the centurion said, no, no, it's okay, you don't have to do that. I understand how authority works. You can speak here and affect things there. And that's the point of that passage, really, is how important, how easy it is to call out to God and Him to respond. We can affect things all over the world, right from this spot. Because that's the way God is. God's everywhere. So He can deal with that. So the importance of intercessory prayer and the power demonstrated there because that statement of faith by that centurion and Jesus prayed and that man was healed in that very hour, wherever he was. Got it. Healed him. Then the third one, the third point with healing number three, verses 14 and 15 of chapter 8, they come into the home of, of Peter's mother-in-law and she's got a fever. She's not feeling well. And he touches her and heals her. And, and, and the point that I got from that, the point that I, I want to share with you, is that God cares about the small things as well as the big. You don't have to have leprosy or, or be paralyzed for God to respond. It can be a fever. It can be a common cold. It can be a tickle in the throat. And you say, God, help me with this thing. You know, and... He does. He will. He cares about those things too, the small things. And then after that, in verses 16 and 17, we see the, the account of just masses of people, a whole group of people that came to Jesus. And, and what I get out of that is how he cares for the masses, but each one individually. He healed them all. And, and Matthew was faithful here to point out that that was a fulfillment of prophecy from Isaiah 53, that he himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. How God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. And so then we talked, there's a section between verses 18 and 22, on the cost of discipleship. And how there were those who said, Lord, I want to follow you. <coughs> Excuse me. But Jesus then says, well, understand, following me isn't always going to be easy street. 
And I think any of us who are Christians and have been Christians for a while will agree with that. There are troubles that do come. It's not like there, I'm saved. I never have to wrestle with anything ever again. That's just not reality. And so he's making that point in that passage that there is a cost to being a disciple of Jesus Christ. But it's really a small cost. In light of all eternity, how much is it? You know, the fact that we got heaven to gain, hell to lose, that's a great thing. Whatever we got to go through, who cares? It's worth it. The cost of discipleship. And from there, we get to where we left off, which is in verse 23. And, and talking after just that, talking about the cost of discipleship, it's in a boat, along with his disciples. And verse 23 says, Now when he got into the, a boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves. But he was asleep. Then his disciples came to him and awoke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. But he said to them, Why are you fearful, O you of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. So the men marveled, saying, Who can this be that even the winds and the sea obey him? A little powerful there, isn't he? Demonstrating his power, his authority over the wind, over the seas. But I was thinking about that right at the beginning. You know, what is discipleship? How do we define that? What, what a great way to define it. It says, now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. That's what it is. Following him. It's getting in the boat with Jesus. Right? We're all on a journey. We're all going somewhere. But it's a whole lot better to have him along for the ride. Have him in the boat with us. Because there are storms. Storms are going to come. Life is not all a bed of roses. Storms are going to come, and when they come, it's awful nice to know that Jesus is beside us, is it not? Now, there are times, though, are there not, where it seems like he's sleeping. Lord, don't you see what's going on? This world is crazy, or, or my life is crazy, or my circumstances are just crazy. Help me, Lord. I need you, and you're sleeping. Where are you? You're not moving. I don't see anything happening. You know, in Mark's account of this, what they said to him is, Lord, do you not care that we are perishing? Like, God does not care. What a crazy thing to say to God, you know? You don't care? <clears throat> Let's see. I sent my son to die for you. I think he cares. He took all of our sin. Yeah, he cares. But we have a destination. Ultimately, it's heaven, right? That's where we're going. But God has a plan and a purpose for each one of us. I like what Proverbs 16, 9 says. A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his step. We got a plan. I know my plan has often been interrupted where God has taken me a different direction than I thought I was going. I get it all figured out until God moves. And that's, you know... Till God speaks, he says something, things change. But I want to be in the boat with him. I don't go anywhere without him. I can't imagine how people get along in this world, separated from God. What do they do when the storms come? You know, in, in Matthew 7, at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, we're talking about those who build their house on the sand versus those who build on the rock. How foolish it would be to build on sand. When the storms come, it's destructive. But when we're on the rock, the house stands. When the trials and the troubles come, as Jesus said in, in John 17, in this world you will have tribulation. There's no wiggle room on you will have, is there? You will have. Praise the Lord for those times when we don't have tribulation. But in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, he said, because I've overcome the world. See, if our eyes are on him, no problem. But when they're not, when they're on the storm, as it was with these disciples, the waves crashing over the boat. Now, I haven't been out in the sea when the waves are that bad. I don't know if any of you are. Some of you guys, fishermen and stuff, 
<laughs> I've been out there where it's a little scary. The words Jean and I had, we were in a canoe when a thunderstorm came. And she was a little delayed at getting that, you know, she wanted to stay and swim. And I like, yeah, but our campsite's about a mile that way. And we could see the thunder, see the storms coming. And we delayed and boy, didn't it rain. It was amazing. Yeah, we're huge seas, probably two or three feet. <laughs> but, you know, that rocks your canoe. So we stayed close to shore. We get back. We're fine. We're still alive. You know, we got through it all. But I've never really been in a boat where I was extremely fearful. Other than that snake in the kayak. That one bothered me a little. But, you know, I bailed out of that. I survived that, too. But, you know, to be out at sea, though. When the things are really boiling, when things are going crazy, you know, it had to be something. Because these are fishermen. These are guys that have been out on this particular body of water often, and they're fearful. It had to be quite a storm. They had to, well, it says the waves were going over the bow of the boat. Um, verse 24, you know, the boat was covered with the waves. I've not had that. I've not had the water coming in. And yet, Jesus, he's tired. He's kind of, you know, he is God, 100% God, but he's man as well, 100% man. He gets tired. And in a storm like that, to be sleeping, oh, I'd be up there with the other guys, ah, you know, freaking out. We're going to die! I know it, you know, it would be like that. And, and yet, he's just, you know, but they awoke him. Lord, we're perishing. Now, isn't that great? Isn't that the way it is when things are troublesome? He's sleeping. Leave him alone. But no, let's wake up. You've got to get scared with us, you know. Come up here. Be panicky. Join us in our, you know. And so he says, oh, why are you fearful? Oh, you of little faith. Now, he wasn't really rebuking them other than rebuking their fear. Think of what they had just seen. They'd seen a leper healed. They, they'd seen a paralytic or heard a report of the paralytic being healed, I'm sure. They had seen his, Peter's mother-in-law healed. And then all these multitudes, demon-possessed and sick people, all healed. They had just seen all this. And then they get in the boat and they're out in the water. They had seen the power of God demonstrated to them through the ministry of Jesus. And he's sleeping. He's comfortable. It'd be okay. It's hard sometimes, though, isn't it? In the midst of a trial, not to be panicky. But he's saying to us, fear not. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. He rebukes that. And really, he rebukes their unbelief. Why are you fearful, O oh, you of little faith? See, and that, that's what fear is. It's the opposite of faith. When we are strong in our faith and aware of the presence of God with us and whatever comes our way, there's no room for fear because Almighty God is with me and my faith is strong. But when things are weak, when I'm, I'm not where I need to be, when we... <laughs> it's just amazing how fearful we can become, isn't it? How... How troublesome. And there are things that scare us. There are things that are difficult. But fear and unbelief go together. And when our faith is strong, there's no room for fear. There's just no room. Because our confidence is not in our own ability. Our confidence is not in our own wisdom, our own power. But our confidence is in the Lord and what He can do. And that changes everything. So that had to be something. Because first they were afraid because of the wind and the waves. And then he stands up and it is calm. That had to be a little freaky too. When he rebukes the wind and the wave. And the sea just goes dead calm. Pshew. I don't know how he did that. I want, you know, it had to be instantaneous. Had to be. Just like turning the spigot off on the faucet. You know, pshew, gone, done, over. A great calm, it says. It was a great calm. It's amazing, isn't it? How when you get through a trial or a trouble, there can be that. 
that peace. Why did I even worry? Why was I concerned? Because God is with me. But these guys marveled, who can this be, that even the winds and the sea obey him? Who can it be? Who else could it be? Except the Son of God. 100% man, he's sleeping, but 100% God, because he can speak to the wind and the wave, and it is dead calm. That's an awesome thing. And so, verse 28, going on, it says, When he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gergesenes, there met him two demon-possessed men coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. So another opportunity for fear, I suppose. Doesn't say anything about the disciples being fearful here, though. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a good way off from them, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said to them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Boy, there's a lot in that story, isn't there? What an amazing story. They go all the way from Caesarea, jump in the boat, go through the storm, they end up in this region. Down, it's from the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. They go down to the southeast side, so they cross the river, but it's kind of a long trip that they went on. And they come to this, as it says here, the country of the Gergesenes. And I tried to figure out what that all was exactly. The meaning of the word Gergesenes is those who come from pilgrimage or fight. So, okay. Um, it's also translated Gadarenes in Mark's account. That's what it is. This, the area of the Gadarenes, which is the inhabitants of Gadara. So perhaps that was the city he went to. Most think so. And the, the word Gadara... Um, this name is a Semite or Semitic name. So there is some relationship to the nation of Israel here. Exactly what it is is hard to pin down, but this is the area that's east of the Jordan. This is the place when Moses was leading the, the tribes of Israel out of Egypt. And they've been in the desert 40 years. It's about time for Moses to die. They've had a battle with Og and Sion. They've killed those great kings of the Amorites. It's that region where Reuben and Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh are going to settle. See, those three tribes did not want to cross the Jordan. Did not want to go into the Promised Land. They were content where they were. They were a little bit complacent in their attitudes, but it looked good to them. And it's a good land. We got a lot of cattle, a lot of herds. Why don't we just stay here instead of entering in where God wanted us to go? They didn't go all the way like they should have. They were comfortable. And I wonder, because of the name Gadara, Gad, you know, I mean, that's the name there. I, I assume, and I think it's a, a fair assumption to say, that this was a region where those of the tribe of Gad had settled at one time. Now certainly when the Assyrians rose up and they came and they took the majority of the tribes of Israel, the ten tribes of the northern kingdom, they captured them, they moved them. But there were still people from those ten tribes around. Why did that happen? Why were they removed? Why, would, why did God allow the Assyrians to come in? Because of their idolatry, because of their unbelief. As we read through the Old Testament, you see the problems that they had, the difficulties. And I, I'm thinking that they settled over here on this side of the Jordan. But see, the Lord said three times a year, men, we need to get together in Jerusalem. But that's quite a long journey. 
And I'm wondering if, as a people, it's just too far. I wonder if that about Reuben and Gad and that half tribe of Manasseh. Did they stop going? Well, we're all right. We're good with God. We're okay. We can just kind of, we're busy. We got, you know, the livestock to deal with. And I can't be going, I'm going to be, we're going to stay there a week. If it takes us a week to get there, a week to get back, we're going to lose two or three weeks, three times a year. That's too much. I'm too busy. I can't do it. And so, because I'm thinking, how did it see a Christian can't be demon possessed? There's no room for the devil to get into a person who's filled with the Spirit of God. There's no room there for such a thing. So, as Christians, we don't, well, you can't be demon possessed. That can't happen. But here in this region are some guys that are demon possessed. And I'm just saying, how does that happen? In the history of that region, how did it happen? Because I know that the Israelites had conquered it. And I know that they were strong with the Lord at one time. And this is what concerns me as I look at my family. And this is, it concerns me as I look at your families. As we consider. Because it's easy to get busy. And I know I'm saved. Yet, if I get complacent. If I don't spend time with the Lord like I should, what is that communicating to my kids? I'm okay, but are my kids? And what about their kids someday? It's so easy to drift. It's so easy just to slide away from the Lord. And I wonder if that happened here to this people, to this region. It seems like it did. There's a question that's out there. Do do Christians have to go to church? Do they? And technically, no, you don't. Right? Our relationship is with the Lord, and we don't have to. And yet, at this, the other side of that corn, Acts 2.42, says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. This is what the early church did. They kept them close to the Lord. They stayed in the Word, the apostles' doctrine, in fellowship. They hung out with other believers. That's critical for us to stay close to the Lord. We need each other. And when you're not in church, or I'm not in church, the body's not complete. We're not whole. We're missing something. So, the Apostles' Doctrine and Fellowship, the breaking of bread, they share communion regularly so that they could remember what Jesus did for them. <coughs> that He's the one who came and paid the price for our sin. It's a form of worship of God important to do. <clears throat> and then the fourth thing in Acts 2.42 is prayer. The importance of prayer. The importance of communication with God. This is what the early church did. This is what we need to do. Because otherwise, what happens? Our kids are watching us. And they see what's important to us and what's not important to us. So do Christians have to go to church? If you're a Christian, no, you don't have to. But you're missing something. And you're communicating something. Not only to your kids, but to your friends, to your family, to other people that you know. So I say, yeah, there's, that you have to. That you must. You want a water? Yeah. Yeah. You want yeah. 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 <laughs> I also have a cough drop if you need one, though. <laughs> catch? <laughs> Drop drop? I got one of them too. I was an awful tickle in my throat this week. You want one? Oh, no. Try it again. <laughs> the importance of, of staying close to the Lord. I, the importance of being together, being involved. And I think what has happened here in this region with these people, because I understand pigs are an unclean animal. They have no business raising swine. They're unclean. And why did God say, don't eat them? God doesn't like pork? Oh, I don't think so. You know, nowadays we understand with our, our microbiology and what we can study, what we know is... They are a dirty animal. And if you don't cook them well, cook them right, 
uh, trichinosis or something, you can get killed. I mean, it'll kill you. You gotta cook it good, you gotta cook it right. Now certainly in this day and age, we have better antibiotics, we have things, makes it a li little easier. But back then, things were not as sterile or clean as we are able to do today, certainly. It was forbidden because it was not wise, it was not healthy. And so these demons, you know, whoever they were, I mean, in Mark's account, <coughs> he asked them, what is your name? And they said, Legion, because we are many. Don't know how many demons were in this guy, but isn't it interesting? The pigs go and do a dive off a cliff into the water. They don't want to be demon possessed. If were, I'm going to have a demon in me, I'm dead. I'm out of here. I don't want this at all. You see, we're created in the image of God. And there's a fight there for us. A spiritual battle that these guys, I can't imagine what their life must have been like. They're living in the tombs. There's an obsession with dead things. With sinful things. They're fierce, they're ferocious, they're scary. Nobody could go past that way. And Mark's account talks how well he tried to chain them even. And to break the chains. So they're super strong. These guys are or something else. And yet, when they see Jesus coming, you know, <clears throat> what have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? See, the demons knew who he was. Have you come to torment us before the time? Isn't that interesting? The devils know they only have a certain amount of time. There is the time. There is the point where they will no longer bother any of us, anybody. That will be a good day. When Jesus comes, no more torment from them. And then it talks about the pig. They say, well, let's go over to that herd of pigs. See, something about a demon, something about these devils. They want to be embodied. I don't understand it. I don't know anything about being a demon. <laughs> Never had that experience, thank you. Uh, but they would rather be in someone or an animal, or a person, preference is a person, it gives them, I guess, access in some way to earth that they don't have any other way, influence perhaps. And so, can we go into those swine and go, one word, go, they're gone. They left. They jump into the pigs. Mark's account tells us there were 2,000. Can you imagine 2,000 pigs all of a sudden, you know, <laughs> squealing and running and phew, and take a dive off a cliff, 2,000 of them into the water. I don't think PETA would like that. <laughs> That's not an ethical treatment of animals at all. 2,000 of them. I, the EPA would probably get involved too. Imagine 2,000 pigs floating in the sea. That'd be quite a cleanup. Wouldn't it? What a mess that would be. And yet, it says, after they went, it says, those who kept them fled, verse 33, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. So they went in and shared the account of everything that happened. This is what happened. You won't believe what happened. And everybody, What? I don't know what the value of 2,000 pigs would be today, but I'm sure it hasn't changed much than what it was worth to them then it would be similar to what it would be to us today. I'm sure that's a lot of money. What's the pig worth? I mean, I, I don't know. How big do they get? What's pork? A couple dollars a pound, three dollars a pound? I don't know. That, that'd be a lot. And so it says they came out. The whole city came out to meet Jesus. And when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Can you imagine that? The whole city. <laughs> you just ruined our economy. Our livelihood. It's gone. We depend on them for our, our, our means to survive. What are we going to do? Get out of here before you cause any more trouble. Go away. Be gone. Not recognizing him. The demons knew who he was. They recognized him. And they certainly understood the power because they had done everything they could to restrain these demon-possessed men. 
Depart from us. We want nothing to do with you. Go away. What a sad thing. The whole city begging, that's the word, begged him, please go away. I met people like that. They're aware that God is who he said he was. But I want to do my own thing. I want to live my own life. And they reject him. And so, yet, these two demon-possessed men, and, and Mark, he focuses on just one of them, but there were two. They are healed. This is the last healing in this chapter, but there's one as we go on to chapter 9. But the point I get out of this one, how Jesus would cross the sea, go to an area where he knows he's going to be rejected, but there's two guys there that need him and that want him. And so he goes through all that trouble, all the difficulty, all the problems for two. See, he would do that. He would leave the 99 and go after the one. That's the heart of God. He would do that. He does that. So, I, I wrote down points for today. Number one, if your trial is a storm of natural causes, you're out on the sea and there's you know, the world's just crazy, and it is. God is greater than circumstance. And we can look to Him. We can turn to Him. Or if your trial is a storm of spiritual causes, like the demon-possessed men, you're being hounded by the devil, tormented spiritually, God is greater than the demons, than the devil. And we can turn to Him, and we can look to Him. But, if your trial is idolatry, The choice is up to us. If we want to hold on to the things of this world, if we're worried about the herd of swine, you know, the financial side of things, or, or other circumstances, <clears throat> and if we're going to say, look, God, I don't want to be a disciple. I don't want to do what you want me to do. I want to live my life my way. If you're saying, depart from me, Chapter 9, verse 1 says, So he got into a boat, crossed over, and came to his own city. He left. He will not wrestle with us. He will not fight us. He will not, in any way, violate our free will. We get to choose. But I pray, you know, choose well. <laughs> choose the Lord. Follow him. That's the choice before us. What is not in Matthew's account and is in Mark's account is how, as Jesus was getting ready to leave, the demon-possessed man, and Mark was only dealing with one, he said, Lord, I want to go with you. I want to be with you. And Jesus said, no, no, I want you to go and tell, go back, show yourself to your family. Go and, and just tell people about me. Tell them what I have done for you. And so if you turn to Mark chapter 6, last point I want to make, because you see Jesus went away, but he got into a boat on another day and he came over, crossed over again, and in Mark chapter 6, verse 1, it says, then he went out from there and came to his own country, oh no, no, I'm sorry, wrong place. Sorry, it's Matthew chapter 9. I'm dyslexic. I turned the 6 upside down. You ever do that? Matt, Mark chapter 9, verse 1. Nope, that's not a detail. I'm in... That's the problem when you depend on notes instead of memory. All right, so he came there again. <laughs> it is in Mark chapter 6. It's verse 53. <laughs> Memory works better than paper, okay? It says in uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 53, When they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there. And when they came out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, ran through that whole surrounding region, and began to carry about on beds those who were sick to wherever they heard he was. 
Wherever he entered, into villages, cities, or the country, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might just touch the hem of his garment, and as many as touched him were made well. See, he does leave, but, but he don't stay gone. He's going to come back another day. But what a difference when he came back that time. Why? I, I believe it doesn't say so, but I think those demon-possessed guys, they went out through that whole region telling, look what God did for me. And as soon as they heard he's back again, what did they do? Oh, they came a-running. How everything changed. And it does. See, just stay in the boat. Stay close to the Lord. And understand the choices we make aren't just for us, though. They're for our kids, our grandkids, and generations to come. It's until the Lord returns. The importance of staying close, staying tight. Stay involved with one another. We need each other. And we have each other. Isn't that cool? God is good to us. So let's stand and pray. And close. You can change it. 140? 404. Huh? 404. You can do whatever you want. You're in charge here. <laughs> M four zero four. solid rock that is you. Lord, we do invite you into the boat to flow along this life with us. Pray, Lord, that you would lead and guide us. Lord, when the storms get to be too much, that you would just calm them, bring calm to us. Lord, thank you for your word. <clears throat> thank you for the truth of it. Please, Lord, uh, make it real to us, more real than it ever has been. And Lord, during this season, when the whole world celebrates your coming, Lord, give us a voice to share the truth of why you came. Bless us now, Lord, as we go. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <coughs>